Are characters in Genshin Impact getting worse? The short answer is yes, but also no. When Genshin Impact initially released back in the fall of 2021, plenty of characters were in the wrong tier in basically every tier list. The biggest defender of this would be Bennett though. Considering the entire metagame is completely based on Bennett and where he fits in teams, Bennett went from being perceived as one of the worst characters to the best character in the game in a matter of a few weeks. Most players towards launch were quick to hop on the train of every new 5 star is broken and power creep, and at the time, everyone was so new that nobody really cared. But as our understanding of Genshin Impact as a whole improved, we began to shape a meta. Players were easily able to clear Spiral Abyss back when the hardest enemies to fight were two Ruin Guards. Since then, Hoyaverse has actively tried to make Spiral Abyss more difficult, and that required the player base to adapt further. And to be completely fair, it's kind of warranted. With the release of characters that are just insanely high damage like Ganyu and Hu Tao, who just trivialize all content, it makes sense that Hoyaverse would want to make their content harder. We also started figuring out some of the strongest combos in the game, for example Child and Shangling, Taser, or just OG national team. Almost every new character in Genshin Impact was hyped up, and players were quick to roll for them. The only exceptions to this were characters that weren't great main damage dealers, like Albedo for example. Later on we saw Kazuha, another support, and the same thing kinda happened. Creators were quick to jump on the, he's just a 5 star sucrose train, and now look at him, he's probably going to sell more than Venti's rerun. Of course there were other factors that led to Kazuha getting skipped, like Ayaka coming after, or Raiden soon after that, but overall a lot of the community was under the impression that he was nothing special. After Kazuha, came Ayaka, and everyone was satisfied with their damage, output, and design, or most people at the least. But what came after Ayaka is what set the Genshin world on fire. And no, that wasn't really meant to be a pyro bun or anything, it's just a metaphor. Yomiya's banner was after Ayaka's, and her reception was so mixed that it started a war in the fandom, worse than anything up until that point. Yomiya was in a weird place, because there were characters like Hu Tao and Shangling in the game who were just better pyro DPS overall. You also had Diluc, who many players had invested into as well, and for Yomiya to be performing near the same level at the time, but be a raid up 5 star character was seen as pretty unacceptable. Now in hindsight, was Yomiya that bad of of a unit? Not really. She still sees some play in Spiral Abyss, and like most other characters in the game, she can clear the hardest content with proper investment. But she was definitely one of the first characters that released that wasn't the best at anything, except for maybe ranged pyro DPS and being cute as heck. And Yoimiya's release would spark an awareness in the Genshin community. Players would begin to look more to leaks to find out if a character's power level would be decent. Fast forward to Raiden's release, the theory crafting community was on top of it. Nobody wanted Raiden to be bad, she's an Archon, and her aesthetic and ability are super cool, but due to her field time requirement in exchange for damage that wasn't considered on par with meta teams, Raiden was seen as a bad character by the theorycrafting community upon her initial release. At Constellation 0 that is. At Constellation 2 or 3, that's a completely different story, since Raiden ends up becoming one of the strongest DPS units in the entire game at that point. But the sentiment that Raiden wasn't good without Constellation 2 persisted through multiple communities and remained for a really long time. Where is Raiden now? Well, she's accepted by most players as a strong unit, even at Constellation Zero just due to the utility she provides. And on top of that, she's pretty fun. But for that period of time around her release, people would argue the opposite. After Raiden came the character that truly pit two halves of the community against each other. Kokomi was an incredibly confusing unit. As one of the few split-scaling characters in the game, players were unsure of her role. Many more casual players thought Kokomi should be a main damage dealer due to her burst, but most of the theorycrafting community put Kokomi into trash tier, which a lot of the time has just ended up being, this character as a support but we don't understand what they do yet here, and that always does get corrected later, with some players even understanding from the start that she's an amazing Thrilling Tales user. Kokomi's release sparked the waifu versus meta war, and it's why many content creators are going to put a 2 minute disclaimer at the start of every one of their Genshin videos. Like two party politics, having two separate sides of the community arguing with each other just made both sides stronger in their own stances. But the one thing that didn't change is that a lot of players felt that Kokomi sucked, at least until her more recent banner where a lot of players actually did pull for her. The amount of players that pulled for Raiden was definitely more, but Kokomi had seen some positive coverage, and it would be wrong to assume that some players didn't change their minds about Fish Girl. The next few months would be straight reruns, up until the release of Arataki Ito, an actually solid geo damage dealer. Some of the player base wanted to be mad about Ito's power level, but at the end of the day, he was just a solid geo unit. Not game breaking, not bad either. But then shortly after, Shinha followed, and it was another instance of this character is bad from a large portion of the player base. But surprisingly, lots of players used her anyways. And 
And as usual, a lot of players' concerns about Shuna were overblown through echo chambers and content creators. Following Shuna came disaster in the form of an unfinished character though, Yai Miko. Yai was interesting because her damage wasn't particularly bad, but her kit just had a lot of clunkiness and demanded a lot of on-field time. Now don't get me wrong, I want to play Yai on-field as much as the next person, but when she's on the field you're barely actually even playing her. Yai created another waifu versus meta war, but it fell off really quickly once players got to be hands-on with her in her trial. Her sales were low, and it was both the reflection of Raiden's upcoming banner and Yai's clunkiness and low damage return per second on the field. More recently, we saw the release of Ayato, a new Hydro Damage Dealer, and again, the trend continued, where a large portion of the community felt like he was pretty bad. But in reality, Ayato ended up being a decent character overall. Not super broken, not strictly a downgrade all the time, just kind of a balanced character that succeeds in certain areas. Just like everyone else. The funny thing about the 2.x releases is that most of the characters that people find underwhelming are actually just good enough to be relevant in some way, but not break the game. There have been characters that are simply just not as good as a lot of 4 stars from Genshin's launch, and you can definitely argue that those new characters are weaker. However, there has yet to be a 2.x 5 star character that has no use at all, except for maybe Yaimiko. Yoimiya handled ranged pyro damage and can hit flying enemies super easily. Raiden is a super broken battery and damage dealer. Kokomi is an amazing Hydro Applier, Healer, and Tenacity Thrilling Tales user. Ito is the premier Geo DPS. Shenha enables Mono Cryo and can improve Cryo teams in some instances. And Ayato is an amazing driver for Taser comps that use Swirls and Electrocharged Reactions. All of these 5 star characters face some skepticism on release, and all of them ended up being not that bad. But there is one other thing that some of these characters have in common, and that is Constellation Lock. Characters in the 2.x series have seen an interesting batch of constellations, but some stick out like an onset damage goblet. Take Yoimiya for instance. Her first large power spike is in her first two constellations, then it's essentially a dead zone until C6. Same thing for Raiden. Raiden's C0 is fine, but constellation 2 and 3 make her one of the strongest damage dealers in the game. Kokomi's constellation 1 makes her a better on-field damage dealer. Yaimiko's first constellations add a lot of damage and range to her turrets, whereas getting her to C6 will over double her damage. Ayato's constellation damage gain isn't really as aggressive as others, but one of his better constellations is constellation 2. Are you picking up a pattern here? Hoyaverse has started trying to incentivize players to go for constellations on 5 stars, and it's working. The amount of low spenders that went for Raiden constellations is insane, and after they've spent on Raiden constellations, they have to spend again to get the next character they want. By locking damage behind a paywall, Hoyaverse has declared war on free-to-play, but I guess you could also argue that they've always been at war with free to play. The main point is that constellations on 5 stars aren't cheap, but if they make the first or second constellations game changing, people are going to go for them. And as a result of this, we have characters that are just good enough at C0 to get through content that's increasing in difficulty. And when you get constellations on these characters, the content becomes significantly easier to deal with. As a result of this, you can definitely make the argument that Hoyaverse has been releasing weaker characters as of late. After all, the first batch of Genshin's lifespan was incredibly imbalanced, and a lot of the starting units are super flexible. But niche doesn't always mean bad. In the case of newer units like Goro and Sara, who are meant to function like Bennett of their element, both units have found a use in a team somewhere. And as long as they're usable in one or two teams, that's good enough for Hoyaverse. Because that means they're not game-breaking, which is exactly where Hoyaverse wants characters to be as they scale up Abyss. They have to catch up somehow. As long as they can sell the solution, characters will stay at the level they're at for a little while. But with that being said, as long as C0 characters are good enough at Constellation Zero, like they have been, that's fine by me. While yes, it is true that the initial Genshin cast and a few banners after the initial release of Genshin Impact were full of characters that are extremely powerful and flexible, and that the 2.x series is not as powerful and flexible, that doesn't mean that these new characters are unusable, and as long as they are somewhat functional, Hoyaverse is completely comfortable with that. After all, they don't want to make the same kit twice in a row. Hoyaverse has said before that their content is the characters that they release, meaning they want each character to have a unique personality, they want each character to have a unique kit, and what that means is that characters that already had the best kits to begin with are not going to be passed up unless they just give them raw number value, and you know what happens when you give characters raw number value. That's the last thing they want. At the end of the day though, considering how many free-to-play players there are, I actually see this as a relatively positive thing, because a lot of the initial 4-star cast
fast is good enough to clear the hardest content in the game. You don't necessarily need to roll for any 5 stars to be able to clear things, and while they will make it easier, as long as the new 5 stars aren't making it so that Spiral Abyss is getting significantly harder to match their strength, and outscaling characters like Hu Tao, Shangling, and Ganyu, free-to-play players will still have a chance to clear the hardest content. But either way, whether or not the initial releases of the game were just broken, or if characters genuinely are getting weaker, most of us can probably agree that power creep is unfriendly to the player base. I don't want it, and you probably don't either. With all that being said, thank you for watching everyone. If you've enjoyed, make sure to let me know in the comments down below. I go live a few days a week at twitch.tv slash Braxophone, so if you like live content, Genshin, Honkai, Tower of Fantasy, and more, come hang out. And of course, if you like the video and want to see more, a like and a sub goes a long way. I'll catch you next time everyone. Peace!